Hello and welcome again to our study of 1 Corinthians. Uh, you'll remember the last time we were together that we went through a number of positive things that Paul saw in the church at Corinth and things for which he was thankful, things that he asked God for in their behalf. But then we began to look and observe that he underscored the word or the name Christ. Nine times in the opening nine verses, he talks about Christ in one way or another. Lord Jesus Christ, simply Christ, uh, Jesus Christ. I mean, there are all kinds of different ways that he says it, but Christ is over and over and over again. He got to verse 10, and in verse 10, he speaks on the authority of, or under the name of, Jesus Christ, His authority. What is it that we need to do by His authority? Well, we need to be sure not to have any division. No divisions if you are under the authority of Jesus Christ. You can't tear the body of Christ apart, parcel it out to different groups of men. That just won't work. Uh, instead, we ought to be united with the same principles and application. Mind and judgment is the idea there. And what Paul is setting forth is that Christians ought to be uniquely the same in what they do. I mean, people ought to be struck by the fact, you know, other people that worship where you worship act like that. They have that same response. They just say no. Instead of taking that first drink, for example, there would be many, many other illustrations. And that's the way it ought to be, according to the Apostle Paul. Unfortunately, at Corinth, Paul has heard probably from the servants in Chloe's house, because it's certainly from the household of Chloe, uh, he's heard that there are quarrels there. There's wrangling, there's fighting, there's fussing. In the remainder of this study today, what we're hoping to do then is to see what Paul's answer is to those quarrels. May I reach heaven's joys, O bright and sun, heart of my heart, whatever befall, still be my vision, O ruler of all. All right, you remember as we closed out our last study together that we were talking about the report that Paul had. So let's pick up again, verse 11, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. For it has been declared to me concerning you, my brethren, by those of Chloe's household, that there are contentions among you. Now, I say this, that each of you says, I am of Paul, or I am of Apollos, or I am of Cephas, or I am of Christ. So, from my perspective, the imagery here is that it's as if somebody has taken the body of Christ, the church of Christ, uh, the church belonging to God, and they've, they've torn off one section, they put it over here, and all these people follow Paul. And then they tore off another section. They put it over here. And all these people follow Cephas or Peter. And then they tore off another piece. And they put it over here. And all these people follow Apollos. And then the fourth piece uh, say that they're following Christ. Now, obviously, Christ is the one we ought to follow. What we don't know here is, are they a sect? Have they made this into a sect? where they're divided from everybody else, or are they truly following Christ? And I'll never know the answer to that. The text doesn't give it to us. But suffice it to say that the church has been busted into parts, torn apart, and now it's following these different men. Now watch Paul as he begins to argue to explain what it is that ought to be the case in every church around the world. Is Christ divided. The word divided there means uh, not just divided, but actually distributed. So imagine that we had uh, all a pizza in front of us, and there were four of us, so we, we took that 
pizza and we, we cut it into four slices and, and we distributed it to each person at the table. You get one slice of pizza. That's what they had done with the church. They had divided it and they had parceled it out uh, to different groups. So Paul says, is Christ divided? Is Christ cut apart and, and distributed to different groups? The obvious answer to this rhetorical question is, no, no, he's not divided. Well, then he goes on and asks a second rhetorical question. Are you, were you baptized in the name of Paul? Now, something that we need to understand here is to be baptized into someone's name means that the individual resides in his power. That's letting us know something very, very important in our relationship to God, and that is that we've got to be baptized in the name of or under the authority of, because that's really what we're talking about, under the authority of Jesus Christ because we want to reside in His power. I don't want to be baptized under the authority of any man because that man is not the one whose power will set me free. And that's what Paul, through this question, is letting them know, calling back to their minds. Then he asks a third rhetorical question, or were you, uh, when he says, excuse me, I, I skipped the second one. Let me go back to that. Was Paul crucified for you? That's, a, <laughs> that's an easy one, isn't it? No. You know, Paul's writing the letter. He's still alive. He's not crucified for them. Who was crucified for them? Well, if you look at each of these, is Christ divided? The obvious answer, no. Was Paul crucified for you? The obvious answer, no. And then, or were you baptized in the name of Paul, under his authority, under his power? And the obvious answer is no. So it's no, no, no. What's he What's he wanting them to see? Christ. The thing that he started out with in the opening nine verses and even went into in the tenth verse, Christ, 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 is what it's all about. And Paul wants this church to remember that. They should have known it from the time when he was with them, but false teachers have caused trouble in that place. So then, out of that background, Paul makes this statement, and it's much abused by people in the denominational world, but listen to it. I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, lest anyone should say that I baptized in my own name. Now, if you don't read the two verses together, <clears throat> if you zero in on one verse, and that is the verse where he says, I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius. If you zero in on that, then like some in the denominational world, you can say, see there, baptism is not important. That, by the way, is in no wise what the Apostle Paul thinks. What Paul is saying is really underscored in the next verse, verse 15, when he says, lest anyone should say that I had baptized in my own name, under my own authority. This is a matter of authority. This is a matter of yielding to Jesus as the Christ, as the King. And Paul didn't want anybody to be able to say that Paul was their leader. He was not their leader. Jesus Christ was their leader. That's what Paul wants them, desperately wants them to see. So, verse 16, Paul sounds like me here, and I'll explain. Yes, <clears throat> I also baptized the household of Stephanus. Besides, I do not know whether I baptized any other. Now, the household of Stephanus were the first fruits uh, of this region of the world. You can find that more nearly uh, in the book of Acts than you are here. But, uh, but Paul's listed two that he baptized. Oh, I forgot one. This is one reason why uh, good public speakers don't often get up and start thanking people. Because invariably you'll thank 
two or three that you remember and somebody will get out of your mind. They won't be there. And you'll have to go back later and correct it. Well, Paul corrects it almost immediately. Oh yeah, there was the household of Stephanus. I did baptize them. But other than that, he said, I don't know whether I baptized anybody. Now he's talking about him physically doing the baptizing. He is not saying that they were not baptized. In fact, you can read the book of Acts and it's pretty clear that all who truly believed when they turned to Christ were baptized. That was a consistent thing in the book of Acts. And it's just as consistent here. Paul did the preaching. They yielded in baptism, but he didn't do the baptizing. And it didn't matter. It doesn't matter who baptizes you as long as they do it under the authority of, guess who? Jesus Christ. <clears throat> because He's the one that was crucified for me. He's the one into whose name I must be baptized or under His authority I must be baptized. So then he proceeds in verse 17 of 1 Corinthians chapter 1. For Christ did not send me to baptize but to preach the gospel not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of no effect. Paul was sent to preach. Preaching results in baptism. Now, if you really want to, to follow this just a little bit, you can back up and think about Jesus. Jesus did a lot of preaching, but who did the baptizing? Well, apparently, the, from what, what the biblical writers tell us, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they were baptized by the apostles. Jesus didn't do the baptizing, but He did do the preaching. The important thing is getting people to realize that they need to turn from sin. They need to have that old man of sin buried in a watery grave with Christ, like Paul talks about, Romans uh, chapter 6, uh, really verses 1 through 11, but especially verses 3 and 4. Uh, they ought to be buried with Him, and then when they come up out of the water, they'll be rising to walk in a new life. They'll be a babe in Christ and no longer a person in sin. So Paul preached. And when he preached, people knew to be baptized, uh, but he didn't do the baptizing for the most part. Uh, he was careful in his preaching, notice, he was careful not to preach with the wisdom of words. Uh, what's, what's the concern here? Philosophy. Remember, Paul came to Corinth immediately from Athens. And in Athens, he had found men who were all wrapped up in every day talking about nothing but words. And you could almost hear them arguing <clears throat> over those words. I'm not going to give an illustration. I'm tempted. Uh, but we do this today. Someone will use a word and somebody will say, well, I don't like that word. This is the only word that fits there. It's like, well, okay. Do, are they basically synonyms? And the answer usually is yes. And if so, then leave the words out of it. Let's just talk about the reality. But whatever the case may be, Paul said, I didn't want to come with human philosophy, human wisdom. Because when you do that, listen to the end of the verse again lest the cross of Christ should be made of no effect. And the imagery here is of the cross dwindling into nothingness. It's a, if you become a human philosopher and talk about the things that you and your human reasoning and philosophy think about, then the cross of Christ is, well, it becomes like throwing water on cotton candy. It's going to just dissolve. And that's exactly what Paul was concerned about. And he was not going to let his preaching go there. So, what did he do? And that's verse 18, beginning. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. <clears throat> In every audience that hears the gospel, there are two basic kinds of hearers. There are those who are perishing. They're lost in their sins. And sadly, 
Those people, as described here by Paul, are people who ultimately uh, see the cross as foolish. And we're going to see two ways in which that was the case. One Jewish, one Gentile. We'll talk about those in just a few moments. But <clears throat> to those who are being saved, now they're, they were just as lost when they heard the gospel as that other group of people. But these people hear the gospel and they respond to the gospel and they're being saved. That's a wonderful, wonderful thought because the gospel is <clears throat> the power of God. The word there for power is the word dunamis. Now, do not make the mistake that I guess I made when I was a younger preacher and say that's the word for dynamite. It was not. Dynamite didn't exist back then. It is, however, the word out of which we got the word dynamite. Uh, so it, it is a very good description, one that can prove to be very useful uh, for all of us. <clears throat> but here, here is the point that he's making. Christ's cross is the power by which we can find salvation. There is no salvation apart from the blood of Christ. Where did he shed his blood? John 19, 31 to 35, he shed his blood on the cross in his death. Remember, the soldiers came to the first thief and they broke his legs to speed up his death. They came to the second thief and they broke his legs to speed up his death. Then they came to Jesus and notice, seeing he was dead already. They didn't break his legs. By the way, that would have been a violation of the law of Moses. Now, not that these soldiers care about it. But through prophecy, through the way that God had them sacrifice the Passover lamb, God was setting the stage for His Son. His Son would be the Passover lamb. We're going to see that in chapter 5 of this epistle. And, and since He was the Passover lamb, you couldn't have a single bone broken. Well, they didn't break His bone. Instead, a soldier took a spear and pierced His side, and forthwith came their out blood mingled with water. Now that blood's vital to the Christian because it is the means of our finding redemption. According to Peter, 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18 and 19, uh, without the shedding of blood there is no remission. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22, it's Jesus' blood that was shed for us. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7. So you see, when Paul says the cross of Christ is the power of God to salvation, that's what he's talking about. It's the blood that Jesus shed on the cross that has the power <clears throat> to remove, to take away your sins and, of course, my sins as well. So Paul goes on then in verse 19 and says, <clears throat> excuse me, for it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Now, that quote is from Isaiah chapter 29. And what he's saying is that human philosophy is going to be smashed by the wisdom of God. And that wisdom of God is seen on the cross of Calvary, as we've just discussed. And that's exactly what he's talking about there. So, Paul goes straight from that quote from Isaiah into these statements or questions. Verse 20, where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? He's basically saying the wise man, the scribe, the debater who argue from human philosophy, human wisdom, they can't even stand up in front of God and in front of the powerful, powerful message of the cross of Christ. So then verse 21, For since in the wisdom of God the world through wisdom did not know God, it pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. Now, anybody, especially in that era, who heard about a crucified king, anybody who heard about uh, the one who was going to rule eternally would have thought, this is ridiculous. 
You think this guy that they hung on the cross is going to live eternally? And you can just about hear them laughing when they hear that. That's not believable. But listen to Paul, <clears throat> verse 22, as he explains what each category, each group saw as foolish about the preaching of the cross. For the Jews request a sign. Oh, wow. If you read the life of Christ, that is apparent throughout. They kept coming to him saying, give us a sign. Show us who you're from. Show us where you come from. And of course, he says, you've had signs. And they had. In fact, on the day of Pentecost, Acts chapter 2, the apostle Peter noted that God had approved of Jesus as his spokesman through the signs, wonders, and various miracles that he worked. But even after he worked a sign, they asked for another one over and over and over again. Uh, they loved the physical things that they could receive, like the feeding of the 5,000. They wanted Jesus to provide their food all the time. Maybe they thought they wouldn't have to ever work another day in their lives. I don't know. But whatever it was, they saw the preaching of the cross as foolishness. That took away, that took away our cash cow. That took away the, the fellow that gives to us. And so they don't like the cross for that reason. But now watch as he goes on to talk about the Greeks. And the Greeks seek after wisdom. The word seek there is in the present tense. And because it's in the present tense, we would, would uh, say it this way. They keep on seeking. They hadn't found it. They didn't find it before. They're not finding it now. But they're going to keep on looking and they're still not going to find it. Because they don't see wisdom in what happened on the cross. Now, we understand a little bit more about that because our understanding of the Greeks. Uh, the Greek thinking was, number one, God is totally good. By the way, they got that right. So you can write that down and you can say the Greeks got it right. God is totally good. But the Greeks also believed that flesh is totally wicked. They got that wrong. It's not flesh that's totally wicked. Instead, it's when you and I yield to our desires uh, that are out of control. That's when we become wicked. But it's not the flesh that makes us that way. It's our yielding. It's, it's our giving up, our surrendering in our mind. But they, for that reason, thought that the preaching of the cross was foolish. Why? Because it meant that God came down to earth, God who is totally good, came down to earth and took on a human body, which is totally wicked, and they would say, that, that doesn't go together. That's like putting oil in water. You can shake it all day long, but you know, if you just give it a few minutes, uh, the, the oil mo molecules will rise to the top, and the water molecule, molecules will go to the bottom. It'll never stay together. And that's what the Greeks thought. So the cross to them was foolish. How could God come down to earth Live as a man, and even beyond that, die? It's beyond their imagination. It's foolish to talk about that. But now listen to Paul. He counters. <clears throat> but we preach Christ crucified. To the Jews, a stumbling block. And to the Greeks, foolishness. All right, stumbling block. The word is scandalon. You don't have to know that. Uh, my, my mom and dad paid a lot of money for me to learn it, and every now and then I use it uh, to justify their paying it. Uh, but you would know what a scandalon is. A scandalon is the, is the stick in the trap. So imagine that some little boys are out and they're trying to catch a rabbit. And so they get a box uh, that the rabbit won't be able to get out of. They set the box up and they put, they put a stick holding the box up at, a, at an angle. And they tie a string to the stick and it goes over here to maybe a carrot or something that the rabbit will eat. Uh, when the rabbit goes in, he begins to nibble on, on the carrot and that pulls the string and the stick drops and the trap falls and they're trapped. All right. The Jews, when they looked at the crucified Messiah, to them, that was the stick in the trap. They, they just could not abide by that. And then what about the Greeks? Well, the Greeks, to the Greeks, the preaching of the cross was foolishness and that that would be our word nonsense. It's just nonsense. There's no way God occupied human flesh. There's no way that God in human flesh died on the cross. That is nonsense. 
So say the Greeks. And that's Paul's point. Now watch, because he pivots and talks about all of us. <clears throat> but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. Remember, we're called by the gospel. And when we yield to that gospel call, we recognize Jesus as God's power to save, Romans 1.16. And we further recognize that He is the wisdom of God. This was the way that God in His wisdom chose to save a sin-sick world. It's really beautiful imagery, and it explains very thoroughly the preaching that Paul did. So in verse 25 of 1 Corinthians 1, he says, Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Our problem is, many times, that we measure things based on our own abilities and our own understanding. I do it. I know others do it on occasion. And I guess when we relate to one another, there's very little harm that comes out of that, although usually it means that I don't pay attention to the other guy who may really have a great idea. But the, when the problem arises is when I, in my, and watch this because I'm being facetious, in my infinite wisdom, when I say, well, you know, that preaching of the cross is a bunch of baloney. Uh, when I do that, uh, <clears throat> I am... Uh, I am unfortunately in the position of thinking that I'm wiser than God. And Paul says, basically, that isn't going to happen. And boy, he's right. That's not going to happen. That did not happen. It does not happen. And that's why he preached the way he did. So verse 26, For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. And therein lies the problem. When somebody is wise, they think they're smarter than everybody else. And even, Paul says, God. They think they're wiser than God. And that won't work. And then the mighty. Well, the mighty are too strong. They can take care of themselves. They can handle any situation that comes along. They don't need God, in other words. And then, of course, the last that he names is, is the noble and that, that word noble that we're talking about there is, is well-born. And, you know, they've got all the money they need. They can pay for whatever they want. They don't need God. And that's what Paul is saying. Though, you notice that not many of those kind of people obey the gospel. Now, there are exceptions to each one of those groups. And we could talk about them. But in general, this is the case. So Paul has laid something out now, the preaching of the cross of Jesus Christ. Why? Because it's God's power to save. The world may think it foolish, but for those of us who are being saved, it is a wonderful thought. <laughs>